This program is paid for by the friends and partners of Touching Lives. Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Here at Touching Lives, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. James Merritt. I thought we'd have a little fun this morning. I thought that I would ask a very fascinating question. And I want you to think about it, and I want you either in your mind, or you may have a pen jot, jot a name down. I want to ask you a question. Who do you think is the greatest songwriter of all time? Now, don't, don't shout out any names, but I want you right now, either mentally or maybe physically, write down the first name that came to your mind. Who is the greatest songwriter, in your opinion, of all time? And I'm asking that for this reason. Rolling Stone magazine recently made a list of who they consider to be the greatest, most prolific songwriters of all time. Now, I'm going to give you the top nine songwriters that they selected in reverse order, and then I'm going to take it down to number two, then I'm going to see if you can guess who's number one. Here's what I want you to do. When I throw a name up there, if you said, hey, that's the name I thought about, I just want you to throw your hand up. I just want to see who got one of these names, okay? So everybody kind of got their name, right? Got kind of, you only get one name, right? So you kind of got your name down, who you think is the greatest, most prolific songwriter of all time. All right, here we go. Number nine, Elton John. Who got Elton John? All right, some of you druggies out there. Okay, great, wonderful. All right, number eight, jo Joni Mitchell. Who got, anybody get Joni Mitchell? Okay, I, I didn't think of her either, all right? Number seven, Paul Simon. Anybody? Oh, got a few got Paul Simon. All right. Number six, Mick Jagger. Okay, let's see the real radicals in the room. Who wrote down? No, nobody's got, not in, a, not in our church. You're not going to raise your hand anyway, right? You, there's some liars out there. All right. Number five, Neil Young. Anybody got Neil Young? Okay, one or two out there got Neil Young. Okay, we're getting down. Number four, Paul McCartney. Okay, a few Beatles fans out there got Paul McCartney. Number three, Bruce Springsteen. Who got Bruce Springsteen? Okay, all right, one or two. Number two, John Lennon. Who got John Lennon? Okay, all right. Now, who wants to guess? You can throw a name out. Who do you think they selected as the number one songwriter of all time? Anybody want to throw out a guess? Who? Michael Jackson. No? Bob Dylan. Who said Bob Dylan? Okay, great. You win the right to give a tithe to our church. All right. Number nine is Bob Dylan. Now, I only have one qualm with that list, and I, I put a lot of thought to it, and, and I absolutely believe with all of my heart, and I want to prove it to you today, I believe that somebody else ought to be in the number one position. Now, I have no problem with Bob Dylan being number two and moving everyone down on that list one slot, but in my humble but extremely accurate opinion, I think by far and away the greatest, most prolific songwriter of all time was a king by the name of David. I think David, by far and away, was the greatest songwriter of all time. You say, well, why do you say that? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. Modern worship leaders today are still putting the songs that he wrote to music. Now, if you don't think that's a big deal, let me ask you this question. How many songs written by those on Rolling Stone's list do you honestly think will still be sung regularly by millions of people thousands of years from now? And yet today, millions of people all over the world will be singing songs that this man wrote thousands of years ago. Now, David wrote at least 75 songs that we know of for sure, and he probably wrote the most famous song of all time. You may have heard it. It goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. To this day, Probably the greatest, most popular song that's ever been written. I believe if David were alive today, without question, he would be on everybody's iPod. His songs would be heard on the radio. His songs would be heard in the malls. And he wrote all kinds of songs. This is the thing about David that amazes me. He wrote love songs. He wrote sad songs. He wrote glad songs. He wrote songs that could pick you up. He wrote songs that could put you down. But every song that he wrote 
had this unique way of going right to your heart. He could write a song that could touch everybody at every age and every stage of their life. Sometimes David wrote songs about tomorrow. Sometimes David wrote songs about today. But today, we're going to listen to a song that David wrote about yesterday. Let me tell you what I mean. The song that we're going to study this morning is a song that David wrote about his past. And in some ways, our past as well. Because let me tell you what I know about everybody in this room. Everybody has a past. You've got a past. I've got a past. We all have a past. And the truth of the matter is, if every one of us would just get honest, and we have lived long enough, and we will live long enough, every one of us will look back, or if you're like me, you can look back, and you can see things in your past that you wish were not there. We've all got things in our past that we regret. We've all got skeletons in our closet that we regret, that we wish were not there. And the reason is real simple. Nobody is perfect. And if every one of us were honest, if we had our lives to do all over again, there are some things that we would do over again. Because nobody lives a perfect life and nobody is perfect. And if we could live life over, there are some things we would all do over. For example, don't need to raise your hand because I know it would get a unanimous vote. You ever said something that you wish you'd never said? Have you ever gone anywhere that you wished you had never visited? Have you ever hurt anyone that you wished you had never offended? See, the problem is those skeletons kind of rattle around in, all, in, in, in our closet. Those do-overs can cause this powerful form of grief called guilt. And the things that we regret the most in life are the things that we look back on and we have to own up to it and we have to say, you know what, that was my fault. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't your fault. It was my fault. I'm the one that messed up. Well, we're in a series that we're calling Fault. And we've been talking about those times when things go wrong in our relationships, whether it's our relationship with God, or our relationship with each other. And what we've been saying is, is that whenever there is a rupture in a relationship, whenever there is a fracture in a, in a friendship, somebody is always at fault. There's no such thing as a no-fault separation. There really is no such thing as a no-fault divorce. When, and, and, and the problem is, too often, whenever a relationship breaks down, what we do is we try to find the blame or fix the blame rather than trying to fix the problem. We said, that's not the way to do it. So we've been spending the last several weeks dealing with the situation where it's not your fault, it's my fault. It's not their fault, it's our fault. And we've been talking about how do you handle a fault when you are the one at fault? How do you handle a sin when you're the one that sinned? How do you fix something when you're the one that broke it? We've been talking about earthquakes. That's kind of where we got this idea. You remember I told you that an earthquake is simply the result of a fault where two layers of rock separate vertically and horizontally and it causes the earth literally to quake. We talked about the incredible damage we all know that earthquakes can cause, but then we've been saying that far more damaging than physical earthquakes or physical quakes are what we call relational quakes. And we said the good news is God has told us in His Word how to put the pieces of a relationship back together when you are the one that broke it. It was your fault. We said there are two steps you have to take. You remember? We said you have to take the step of confession and you have to take the step of repentance. We said, first thing you've got to do when you're the one at fault, you've got to confess your fault to God because every sin, first of all, is against God. We said, you confess your fault to God, and then whoever you've hurt or offended, you go and you confess that fault to that person. Then last week we said, but that's not enough. You can confess, you can say, I'm sorry, but that still won't solve the problem. We said last week, you need to repent of what you've done. You need, by the grace of God, to say, God, I want to turn away from that behavior that caused that problem. And with your help, I don't ever really want to go back and repeat that behavior again. Well, today, we're going to look at the last step that we've got to take if we're going to be totally free from our fault. I'll tell you why that's so important. David wrote a song, and he wrote a song about how he found the way back to redemption and restoration and reconciliation because of something happened that was his fault. And it caused an unbelievable earthquake in lives that almost killed an entire kingdom. 
So if you brought a Bible or an iPad or a smartphone or a tablet or whatever, I want you to turn to the book of Psalms. It's the, it's the biggest book in the Bible. It's almost in the middle. You can't miss it. And I want you to turn to the 32nd Psalm. Remember now, Psalms are songs. And I want you to turn to Psalm 32. And here's what David is doing. In this Psalm, David is looking, in effect, in the rearview mirror of his life at a terrible sin that he had committed in the past, and it was his fault. And the ghost of guilt, from the time that David blew it, from the time that David messed up, the ghost of guilt had haunted David 24-7 until he finally made things right with God and with the people that he hurt. So what you're really looking at today in Psalm 32, this is a good way to look at it, this is kind of an x-ray of a forgiven heart. This is an x-ray of what someone looks like when they're totally right with God and they know it. And they're totally right with other people and they know it. This is the x-ray of a heart of a someone who said, I'm the one that broke it, but with God's help, he helped me to fix it. And so this is what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, in case you don't know the story, in case you're here today and you don't even know who David is or don't remember his story, let me just kind of give you a quick review. Many of you will remember it. David had committed adultery with another man's wife. And he'd gotten her pregnant. And rather than doing the right thing, because he'd done the wrong thing, he doubled down and did another wrong thing. So he has her husband murdered to hide what he's done. Well, that thought caused a relational and emotional and a personal earthquake that left behind unbelievable damage. It cost an innocent man his life. It cost a newborn baby boy his life. It destroyed a marriage, it shamed a king, and it broke God's heart. And David was totally in the wrong. It was all David's fault. It was completely him. Now, at this point in his life, David would have been a prime candidate for this series that we're in because remember, we said the first step you've got to take, if you want to fix what you've broken, you've got to confess. You've got to confess your sin. All right, David had done that. He had confessed his sin. Then we said the second thing you've got to do is you've got to repent of your sin. And by God's grace, you've got to turn away from it. Well, guess what? David had done that. But now what David does is so important. David tells us how to plant your feet on the solid rock of forgiveness and turn the sadness of a fall into the gladness of forgiveness. And this is what I want you to take out the door. And some of you, you're going to be so glad you came this morning because I know where some of you are living right now. Listen. You will only act forgiven. That's a key word. You will only act forgiven when you accept the forgiveness that God has applied. Now, let me tell you who I'm talking to this morning. There's some of you in this room, and you blew it. It's your fault. You're divorced, and the divorce was your fault. You're the one that messed up. Whatever whatever it was that broke down the marriage, you know that you're primarily responsible. Your spouse did not want the divorce. You insisted on the divorce. You look back, it's one of the greatest regrets you have in your life. And you've confessed before the Lord how you blew it. You've repented of it. You've turned away from that sin. Maybe you've even gone to that ex-spouse and you've asked that spouse to forgive you of your sin. But you still struggle with the guilt of this. You still don't feel forgiven. All right, maybe it's, it's some other type of sin in your life. It could be a sexual sin or a social sin or some other kind. Maybe it's a financial sin. I don't know what it is. But you've taken these two steps I've talked about. You've even walked out the door and you've said to yourself over the last two weeks, I don't understand it. I've done what you've asked me to do, Pastor. I've confessed. As a matter of fact, I've confessed this to God a thousand times. And, and I've repented. I've honestly turned away from it. Why do I still feel guilty? Or here's something I hear from so many people all the time. You know, I know God's forgiven me, and and, and I know that the other person's forgiven me, but I just can't forgive myself. Well, how do you get past that? How do you do that? And I'm going to show you today how to do that once and for all. There are three steps you need to take. Some of you really need to hear this. Number one, you've got to recognize your sin. We've got to go back. Let's go back to the basics. You've got to recognize your sin. Listen to what happened. Even though this is a song about a fault and a failure in David's life, it's not a song about sadness. It's a song about gladness. It begins with the words, blessed is the one, and it ends with the words, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the word blessed in the the Hebrew and the Greek language literally means to be happy. 
I, I have found in my life the happiest person in the world, the happiest person in the world is a person whose conscience is clear and whose fault has been forgiven. Well, David is a happy guy. You say, but he committed adultery. He did. He had a man murdered. He did. He cost a baby boy his life. He did. Well, how in the world could David be happy? Because even though he had done wrong, God had made him right. Even though he had gotten filthy, God had cleaned him up. And the reason why God had made David right is because he admitted he had been wrong. Now, if you know David's story, you'll know this. If you don't, let me go back and tell you one part I didn't share. When David first did all of this, he gets, he gets Bathsheba pregnant. He has Uriah murdered. When David first does all this, he tries to cover it up. He hid it. He didn't say anything. And if you know his story, that really didn't work out too well for him. As a matter of fact, he tells us about it in verse 30, Psalm 32, verse 3. He says, when I kept silent, that is, when I didn't say a word, when I didn't confess my sin to anybody, I tried to cover it up, I tried to hide it. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand, that is God's hand, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. David said, you know, I tried to cover this thing up. I tried just to keep quiet about it. And you know, it, it, it almost killed me. I couldn't sleep. My bones hurt. My body hurt. My head hurt. My heart hurt. Nothing worked out right whatsoever. But let's just be honest. David tried to do what all of us have this tendency to do when we mess up. See, we, 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 our tendency is not to fess up when we mess up. Our tendency is to cover up what we messed up. Because most of us, if we're honest, we carry a broom with us everywhere we go. Because we just have this tendency to kind of sweep things under the rug. Nobody will know. I mean, how many times have we done wrong? Look, I've done this. How many times have you done something wrong and you tried to analyze it? And you tried to rationalize it? So you'll say things like, well, I'm not the only one that's done this. Now, you know, next time that you get caught for speeding, try that on the police officer. See how that works out for you. I'm not the only guy that's been caught doing 90 in a 30 mile per hour speed zone. I'm not the only guy that did that, right? How's that going to work out? Or, or we'll say something like this. We'll, we'll uh, you know, we'll, it really didn't hurt anybody else. It really just maybe just hurt me. Or, or here's what we love to do. We love to blame the problem on something else or somebody else because we're living in a no-fault society. It's never our fault. It's like the little boy I heard about that got into a fight and one of his classmates and the teacher saw the fight and she came over to break it up. She said, what's going on here? And the little boy said, well, it all started when he hit me back. Now, that, that's kind of the way we think. That's kind of the way we live. It's never our fault. And David finally realized you'll never get clean until you come clean. Let me say that again. You'll never get clean until you come clean. And David was not put on the freeway of forgiveness until he finally recognized his sin for what it really was. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Now, let's go back and listen to these first two verses. By the way, read this slowly and carefully because every word is very important. David said, blessed, this is a guy that's happy. You want to be happy, David said, then you'd be like, be like me. Blessed is the one whose transgression, keep that word in mind, is forgiven. Whose sin, keep that word in mind, is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Keep that word in mind. And whose spirit, in whose spirit, there is no deceit. Now, let me, we're going to get deep here, so stay with me. It is one thing to understand the definition of sin. It is another thing altogether to understand the depth of sin. It's one thing to understand what it means to be at fault. It's another thing to understand how deep that fault really goes. And David uses three different words to describe the three different types of faults that we all have and that we all commit because he wants us to know just how deep these faults in us are and just how many of these faults that we have so first of all he refers to transgression he says blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven now let me tell you what the word transgression or transgress means the word transgress literally means to trespass when, when you when you go into somebody's uh, uh, property and they they've crossed they they have they posted a no trespassing sign if you go onto that property, you have trespassed, you have transgressed. So when you trespass on someone's property and cross into forbidden territory, you have transgressed. So let me, let me give you a biblical illustration. 
When you go to the Ten Commandments, there, there are two types. There's negative commandments and positive commandments. God sometimes says you shall do this, and God says sometimes you shall not do this. All right, let me make it real easy for you to understand. When God says you shall not, in other words, this is forbidden territory. When God says you shall not, but you say, yes, I will, and you do, you transgress. That's a transgression. You have crossed over into forbidden territory. Now, you think about this. How many times every day do we transgress? How many times every day do we cross over into the forbidden territory of anger or lust or jealousy or bitterness or selfishness or indifference? How many times every day when we know God has said no to something, we say yes to it anyway? David said, that's transgression. Then he goes on to say this. He said, blessed is the one whose sin is covered. Now, you're probably asking right now, okay, what is the difference between a sin and a transgression? Here's an easy way to remember it. When you do something you should not do, that's a transgression. When God says, thou shalt not or you shall not, you say, yes, I will, and you do it, that is a transgression. So, when you do something you shouldn't do, that's a transgression. When you don't do something that you should do, that is a sin. So here's an example. You should have said something about Jesus to somebody, but you kept your mouth shut. That's a sin. You know that you should have given something, but you didn't. That's a sin. You go to bed, and just before you turn out the light, you realize, I didn't read my Bible today. I should have read my Bible, but I didn't. That is a sin. So to put it another way, when God says, you shall, and you say, I won't, you have sinned. Then he goes on to say this in verse 2. He says, blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Now, it's easy to understand what a transgression is. I'll explain that. It's easy to understand what a sin is. You understand that. But now the question is, okay, well, what is an iniquity? All right, this is a, try to make this very easy. Iniquity is when you take something that is right, but you use it in the wrong way. Here's an example. We take sex, which is right, and we turn it into adultery or fornication, which is wrong. That's an iniquity. When we pervert justice, when we pollute the environment, we're committing iniquity. We take something that God meant for good, and we turn it into something bad. So David says, understand just how deep your faults go. You've got sins that you commit, and you've got transgressions that you commit, and you've got iniquity that you commit. Now, the question is, why does David go into such depth about sin's depth? Why does David go so deep into just how deep sin really is? Because David understands something you need to understand. You'll never understand, A, just why you need to be forgiven, B, just how costly forgiveness is, and see how desperately we need to have it unless you understand how deep your sin really is, how deep your faults really are, and how numerous your faults really are. So David says, if you want to be forgiven and live forgiven and know you're forgiven and go to sleep forgiven, you've got to plant your feet on the solid rock of honesty and get honest with God and honest about yourself about your faults. So David said, first thing I did was I recognized my sin. Everybody got it? Step two. Once you recognize your sin, then you realize God's forgiveness. Now, in case you're feeling real bad right now, some of you are probably thinking, gosh, I knew it was bad, but I didn't know it was that bad, right? Or some of you may be saying to your husband right now, I told you you were that bad, okay? Here's my point. Listen, this is not a song of sadness. This is a song of gladness. Oh, yes, David was sad over his faults, But he was even more glad over his forgiveness. And here's what I want you to watch. David says, look, for every type of fault that we have, God has a solution. For every way that we do wrong, for every fault we have, God has the perfect remedy. For every spiritual sickness that you have, God has a spiritual cure. So let's go back. So what about the times that we trespass, when we go into forbidden territory, when God says you, sh- you, you shall not and we do it anyway? What about those times when we do what we should not do? How does God handle that? Verse 1, he said, blessed is the one 
whose transgression is, say that word with me, forgiven. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Now, this is important. The word forgive literally means to carry away. That's what the word forgive literally means. And, and, and it, it, it means to lay, that, that you lay the blame on somebody else. All right, here, here's a great biblical illustration of that. Have you ever heard the term scapegoat? Everybody heard the term scapegoat, right? Okay. A scapegoat is somebody that takes the fall for somebody else. You may not know where we got that term. Let me tell you, because it comes out literally out of the Bible. Back in the day when Jewish people used to make sacrifices for the sins of the people, once a year they would all gather together, all of them. The whole nation would gather together. And the high priest would bring out a goat. And the high priest would lay his hands on that goat. And he would confess all the sins of all the people, all the transgressions of all the people, all the times that they had crossed over for, into God's forbidden territory. He would lay his hands on that goat. And he would confess all of the sins over that goat. He would literally, uh, figuratively rather, he would lay all the sins of the people onto that goat. Then they would release that goat and send that goat out into the wilderness never to be seen again. David says, that's what God does with all of our transgressions. He carries them away. Now, you know how God does that ultimately and eternally, right? Jesus is the ultimate and the eternal scapegoat. And when God allowed his son to be crucified on the cross, he took all of our iniquities, he laid them on Jesus, and when Jesus died and came back from the dead, he carried all of them away. All right, got that. All right. Then he says this, blessed is the one whose sin is, what's that word? Covered, all right? Whose sin is covered. Now, this is what's so ironic to me. And I'll tell you, when David wrote this, he probably was crying and laughing at the same time because this is what's so ironic. When we try to cover up our sin, God will reveal it. Be sure, the Bible says, your sin will find you out. Be sure. When we try to cover up our sin, God will reveal it. But guess what else happens? When we confess our sin, God will conceal it. Isn't that strange? If I try to cover it up, God says, I'm going to uncover it. But God says, once you uncover it, I'll cover it. Remember the phrase, out of sight, out of mind? Let me tell you this. Listen to this. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood covered all our sins. Sometimes I, my, Harper's asked me this before. Harper says, Pop. Is there anything that God can't do? And, of course, there are some things God can't do, right? You know, God can't create a rock so big he can't pick it up because, you know, God's omnipotent. God can do anything. You know what I told Harper one time? I said, Harper, God can't see our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Can't see it. Absolutely, totally, completely covered up. It's out of sight and it's out of mind. That's what God's Word means when it says God forgets our sin. Now, this is so important. I don't want any of you to miss it. When God forgives our sins and God forgets our sins, we should too. I'm going to say that again. When God forgives our sins and God forgets our sins, we should too. Now, listen carefully. Watch this. When we remember what God remembers, we are guilty. In other words, God remembers our sin. God says, you did it, you were wrong, you need to confess up to it. You go to God and you say, God, you're right. I remember exactly what you remember. We are guilty. All right, when we remember what God remembers, we are guilty. Now watch this. When we remember what God forgets, we feel guilty even though we're not guilty. When we remember what God forgets, we feel guilty even though we're not guilty. Everybody got that? All right, now watch this. When we forget, what God forgets, we are not guilty and we won't feel guilty. When we forget what God forgets, we're not guilty and we won't feel guilty. See, the reason why sometimes we feel guilty even though we're not is because we keep trying to remember what God has already forgotten and we keep trying to uncover what God has already covered. There was a man that went to see his doctor one time and he said, Doc, you got to help me. And the doctor said, well, what's wrong? He said, I'm suffering from amnesia. He said, really? He said, yes, I've got this bad problem with amnesia. He said, well, what should I do? Doctor said, Just go home and forget about it. Now, that's exactly what God does with our sin. When you come to God and you confess and you repent, God says, okay, go home now and forget about it because that's exactly what I'm going to do. I forgive and I forget. 
And then David says this in verse 2. He said, blessed is the man against whom the Lord, what's that word? Counts no iniquity. Star, you'll love this. You're a CPA, and, and we both majored in accounting. That word count is an accounting term. It literally is an accounting term, and it, and it means to charge something to someone's account. Remember I told you last week or the week before, sin is a debt that we incur. Well, here's what God does. When we come to God and we confess our iniquity, when we confess anything that we've done wrong and however the way we've done it, what God does is he says, you know what? I'm going to wipe that debt off the books. And the reason why God can do that is because he's charged all of our sins to the account of Jesus. So here's what David's trying to tell us. As deep as our faults go, God's forgiveness goes even deeper. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. And David said, for everything we've ever done against God, you know what God's done with it? God's carried it away. God's covered it up. And God's canceled the debt. Can you just give the Lord a hand for that this morning? I mean, that's just, that's just great news. Every, think about it. Everything, everything you've ever done, everything, I mean everything. God says, hey, I've carried it away, covered it up, canceled the debt. We need to realize God's forgiveness. Here's the problem. Some of you are sitting there and you're saying, I get that, I understand that, I have heard that, but I'm still on a guilt trip because even though I know God has forgiven me, I still haven't accepted it. Now you need to take the third step, and this is the, this is the step. You've got to receive God's grace. Now watch how this works. Listen to verse 5. Here's what David says. David says, I acknowledge my sin to you. Okay, I confessed it. I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. That's, that was repentance. He said, I, I'm turning away from this. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. But you know what the word selah means? It means pause and think about that. Stop and think about that. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now watch this. This, is going to be, this will be worth the whole price of the trip this morning. This is the longest verse in this whole psalm, which tells us it's probably the most important verse and the very heart of what David is saying. Because what David is doing is he's giving testimony of two things, just how forgiven he is and just how forgiven we are. Now, don't miss the progression. Watch, watch what David says. David says, when we acknowledge our sin, when we uncover our iniquity, when we confess our transgression, God completely forgives everything and totally washes away the dirt of all of our guilt. Because here's what you're going to find out. When we conceal our sin, guilt will imprison us. But when we confess our sin, grace will free us. Now here's what happens. Watch this. When you take your sin basket and it's full, you take maybe at the end of every day like mine, man, my sin basket, Lord, it's full again. And every time you take your sin basket to God and you dump it all out, God fills that basket with his forgiveness. No matter how dirty you are, when you get into the shower of God's grace, you are completely, immediately, and permanently clean. And here's what I'm telling you. If God has forgiven you, you must forgive you. I'm going to tell you why. If God has forgiven you, but you don't forgive you, you just insulted God. Because what you really have said to God is this, I'm better than you are. I've got a higher standard than you do. And I'm going to tell you, if you want to slap God in the face and insult the deity of heaven, you dare tell him that your standards are higher than you. He, you know what God says to you? You know how high my standard is? My standard is so high, I allowed my own son to be crucified for you. So don't tell me about how high your standards are. My standards are so high, my standards are infinitely higher than you are. And if I have forgiven you, don't you dare insult me by not forgiving yourself. Don't you dare insult me by not forgiving yourself. If God has forgiven you, you must forgive you. You must do that. You must start thinking like a forgiven person, acting like a forgiven person, talking like a forgiven person. Now, let me watch this. Suppose you're sitting there and you're saying, well, pastor, I, I, I'm kind of like David. I, I sinned against someone, maybe like David did, or some other type of sin. 
And let's suppose that you go to God and you confess that sin and God forgives you and you, you accept God's forgiveness. You say, but here's my problem. I, I went to the person that I did wrong and, and, and I asked their forgiveness, but they refused to forgive me. They said they would not forgive me. So what do you do when you go to someone that you've asked forgiveness from, you go to someone you've confessed, you're trying to make things right. What do you do if they want to hold on to their grudge and they want to hold on to their bitterness? All right, listen carefully. At that point, their problem is no longer your problem. At that point, their problem is no longer your problem. And don't you ever let anyone keep you on the freeway of guilt when God has put you on the exit ramp of grace. Don't you ever let anyone keep you on the freeway of guilt when God has put you on the exit ramp of grace. Now, you may be here today or, or, or maybe at our Mill Creek campus or you're listening and, and, and maybe you've confessed over and over and again and you're saying, look, I know in my head God's forgiven me, but in my heart I've not forgiven myself. And why do I keep having these guilt feelings? Why do I keep getting convicted? Why does this thing keep coming up in my mind? All right, let me help you and we'll be done. At that point, I want you to always remember this. If you're still on a guilt trip of something that you've confessed, that you repented of, and that you know in your heart God has forgiven you of, if you're still on a guilt trip at that point, remember this, you are no longer dealing with God. Now you're dealing with Satan. Now you're dealing with a totally different spiritual being. I want you to listen to this. You need to write this one down. Satan will accuse you of sin that God has already forgiven. Satan will accuse you of sin that God has already forgiven. God's Spirit will only convict you of sin that you've never confessed. God's Spirit will only convict you of sin that you've tried to cover up. Let me tell you why. God never digs up old dirt. God never digs up trash that has already been buried. You know, one of the great things about living in America is the Constitution. One of the greatest, maybe the greatest document outside the Bible that really has ever been written. Unbelievable foresight that our forefathers had writing the Constitution. Well, you probably know this, but the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution gives us what is known as the law of double jeopardy. And what the Fifth Amendment basically says is this, that once a person is found innocent of a crime, he can never again be tried for that crime. Even if you're guilty, if you, if you go before a jury of your peers and they pronounce you not guilty, even if later on it comes out you're guilty, you're not guilty, you can never be tried for that crime again. Listen to this. There's also a law of spiritual double jeopardy. Once God convicts you of sin, and once you confess that sin and repent of that sin, you receive forgiveness of that sin and God makes a promise, I'll never bring that up to you again. I'll never throw that up in your face again. As a matter of fact, I not only forgive it, I will forget it. I read something, something happened, uh, in fact, it just uh, happened not long ago. It's kind of an amazing story. On March the 5th, 2010, a lawyer named Mario Gonzalez lodged a complaint with the Spanish, Spanish Data Protection Agency and against a newspaper and against Google, the search engine. Here's what happened. Three years earlier, Gonzalez's house had been auctioned off to pay off his Social Security debts. Already been paid off, already done. Well, a newspaper ran an article about it. it. caused him great embarrassment. Well, he sues the newspaper. And the newspaper found out about it because when they Googled his name, this information came up. So he sued the Spanish Data Collection Agency. He sues the newspaper, and he sues Google. Well, Google took the case to the highest legal authority in Spain. They confirmed the original decision that a search engine should remove links to an individual on the ground that any information that might be prejudicial to him that has already been dismissed should never be brought up again and that he have a right to have it forgotten. And in so doing, the court now has endorsed a relatively new addition to a catalog of human rights and it's now called the right to be forgotten. So from now on, at least in Spain, let's say that you, you, know, you, you, you embezzled money, you served time in prison. If they Google your name in Spain, they, that, that information, if you've served your time, if you've been forgiven or whatever, that can never be come up, but never come up again, can never be brought up because the, the Spanish court said, your iniquities, your sins, your transgressions, whatever you have done, you have the right to have them forgotten. And I read that and I thought, man, the best news of all is we have the right to have our sins forgiven and forgotten 
because of the cross of Jesus Christ. I have the right even to say to a holy God, based on his character and his word, you'll, you can never bring this up to me again because of the blood of Christ has been forgiven and forgotten. And that's why David says this in verse 6. If they'll put it up there. There we go. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the grush of great waters, they shall not reach him. Here's how David closes this whole thing. When David cried out to God, God forgave him. And the same God that forgave David will forgive you. So if you're listening today and you're sitting there and you, you know it's your fault that caused a relational earthquake and it separated you from God and it separated you from others, here's the good news today. Through Jesus Christ, anytime you're ready, you can plant your feet on the solid rock of God's grace. You can plant your feet on the unshakable ground of God's forgiveness. And you can know that once and for all, you can go to sleep with a clean, clear conscience because all has been carried away, all has been covered up, and every debt has been canceled. This October, join Dr. James Merritt and friends in beautiful Branson, Missouri for the 2021 Mountaintop Conference. This Ozark City offers something for everyone, from world-class dining and live entertainment to unique shopping and outdoor recreation. There is an adventure waiting for you. This event will feature powerful preaching daily from Dr. Merritt. Joining him will be his friends, Bellevue Baptist Dr. Steve Gaines and First Baptist Concord's Dr. Jim Collier. You will also get to hear from the legendary Oak Ridge Boys when they stop by to share some of their story. Enjoy incredible music from Grammy Award-winning Guy Penrod and one of Christian music's biggest artists, Crowder. Visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details and reserve your spot today. the lives of the lost and enriching the faith of the found. This is Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. This broadcast is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.